Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Jet Real Podcast. I'm your host, Jill Treese, and um, we got a topic today. Um, this is the first episode that I've ever actually written, like, an outline for what I need to and want to talk about, so um, it's going to be a good one. Also, kind of just woke up to record this um, early because last night, oh my god, I just could not do it. It was late and I was so tired and I just couldn't make myself stay up to record it. So I got up early, so I'm sorry. It's late, but this is going to be an important episode, so let's just jump into it. friendships. I hope that you guys are ready to pay attention to an episode because um, if you remember last week's episode was um, called Changing How I Train Horses and um, you know um, I said a lot of things that I really meant in that episode but I feel like um, I kind of need to like do some damage control with that one um, just because like I kind of, like, had a conversation right before I recorded that episode, as I mentioned in it, and I was like, yes, this is, I finally, like, it clicked, I know what I want to do now, and I just kind of, like, flew by the seat of my pants and talked about it. Oh, sorry, I literally just woke up. (laughs) Um, But I do want to, um, you know, like, I fleshed it out a little bit, I know um, more about what... I'm trying to do, and I want to be more clear, and, um, maybe you feel the same way, and so, let's, let's talk about it. So, um, you know, first of all, I want to be clear that, um, you know, while I am changing exactly what I'm doing, I'm not denouncing positive reinforcement in the slightest, um, and by denouncing, I not only mean I'm not, like, saying it doesn't work, but I'm also not not using it <laughs> now. Like, s- still what I do will be predominantly positive reinforcement. I'm not switching back to, like, traditional writing and what I used to do before um, before I moved here and started working with positive reinforcement with Zoe. Like, oh my god, I'm so sorry. <sighs> I keep yawning. Um, but... Um, I don't want to not do positive reinforcement, and, um, I don't want to only do traditional writing. I'm not planning on, like, you know, jumping right back into eventing or anything like that. That's not even on my radar. Um, it's just, like, I'd like to be able to get on and walk. Like, (laughs) that's the thing. Um, but I'll get to more about that later. Um, so, what I am doing, I'm not denouncing positive reinforcement, I'm not I'm not using it anymore, I'm not saying it doesn't work, and I'm not saying that I want to go back to traditional. What I am doing is softening my rigidity on never using any pressure. So what that means is um, I'm going to keep the force-free, positive reinforcement-based training and using the LIMA approach, I think it's least invasive, minimally aversive. Um, So you start, you know, with the least invasive, minimally inversive. It's either invasive or intrusive. I don't remember what the I stands for, but it's one of those. And, um, you start with the easiest, like, positive reinforcement, and then you gradually work your way up. Um, I don't ever plan on crossing into positive punishment, um, but a little bit of, oh my god, I a little, a little, a little, I hope that you all enjoyed that. Um, it was really cute. <laughs> lots of facial expressions with that one. Um, but I do um, plan on using some negative reinforcement. And, um, you know, if you've listened to the earlier episodes of this podcast, like season one when it was equine in theory, or if you've been following me for the past year on Instagram, you've known that my entire, like, thing has been switching to positive reinforcement. And, um... I think it's really important because, um, that journey was pivotal for me and I'm still on it and, um, I haven't learned everything that I want to learn, but positive reinforcement is just like, it, it helped my relationship with Zoe so much and, um, you know, now I'm going to use everything I know and all the skills I've acquired from each method to find out what works best for us and because, 
like posit like just using strictly positive reinforcement like going out into her field not putting a halter on her not leading her because i haven't taught her how to lead you know without negative reinforcement like that would be doing pure positive reinforcement now most positive reinforcement trainers are like you know if it ain't broke don't fix it unless you just like absolutely want to like leading like if zoe leads fine with pressure it's fine like you don't have to retrain it you can just keep using that cue if it doesn't upset them and they respond to it um easily but um you know it's just like I can't do pure positive reinforcement the facility isn't set up like that and I'm not an adept enough trainer um and I think that I could be if I applied myself to it but I'm thinking about how I'd like to make it practical And, um, because I think that, like, no matter what you do in horses, you should absolutely use positive reinforcement in your training. Um, while you do have to be careful about it because you don't want to, um, poison cues, um, or, uh, leave your horse not knowing what to expect from you, um, you know, it is, it's an amazing thing. It can strengthen your relationship and it makes your horse super happy to work and, um, I don't know. I just think it is definitely a kind way to train. Um, hey, why are you yelling? I don't know if you guys can hear the little orange. He's yelling. Marlis. Um, okay. Anyway. So, um, what, what started, um, what I wanted to say with this podcast is that, um, I was listening to Mosey Turret's podcast Um, It's called the In the Spirit of Horse podcast, and you can listen to it on all the same platforms that you're listening to this one. Um, Episode 41, Moving Beyond Just One Method with Jess Roberts, resonated so much with me that I'm going to listen to it again. (laughs) And, um, like, it just, it really hit home with me. Um, Just the things that they were talking about, about perfectionism and, um, you know, such rigidity and it's just like it just it all made sense and I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that um came up in that episode so starting with um you guys know if you've been following me for a minute that um over the past like six months um I've been dealing with a lot of depression and um with that um and you know I don't know if it was chicken or the egg but, oh my god, another yawn. <sighs> if you're listening to this podcast at happy hour, take a shot every time I yawn. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so, I just, like, really have been feeling uninspired and not connected. And I just, like, nothing was drawing me into the horses. And I just, I felt like it was like a, you really should go do this. It felt like a should instead of a, um, like, I really want to do this, and I love my horse, and I want to work with her, and I miss all of that. It just became, like, a, I feel like I should be doing that, and I'm doing something wrong by not, and, um, but I wasn't really enjoying the work that I was doing. Like, I know that, um, that it can be done with positive reinforcement, but the way that I was doing it was not practical for me, Like, I would just go out with Zoe and work on mat training for 10 minutes. And then, you know, if I started noticing she was getting fatigued or whatever, then I would cut it short and that would be it. And, like, we would just, like, she would have just been standing on a mat. And, like, those behaviors are super um, useful, but it's, I feel like that's kind of um, going to have to be some in-between work for us because, like, you know, I've heard some stories of, like, um... Cindy Martin, I believe, had a mare that when she got on, she couldn't get the mare to walk, so she used mat training because the mare knew about that, so she'd, like, walk from one mat to another, and, um, the mare would, um, started learning how to walk with a human on her back that way, and I think that that is incredible problem solving using positive reinforcement and not, like, just wailing on the horse until it walks forward, um, but it, um, I also, like, don't have that problem, (laughs) um, and I'm not saying that you should only use it if you are having an issue, but I definitely think, you know, you should use it as 
preventative and to help your training and um, I'm going to use it as the predominant basis for my training um, but like I just I really just can't do the like just chilling in the pasture for 30 minutes a day d like getting nowhere near my goals and that could be for lack of like you know following an outline or like making a designated training plan but the thing is like and maybe I'm being selfish and like just too carefree but I I don't want to have to do all of that I really don't it, it sucks the fun right out of horses and that is a huge huge deal for me I I got so caught up in the ethicality of everything that I was like I just I can't move anymore and um you know over the past few weeks I've really felt my draw to horses returning and I feel like I it's so weird because I just posted like a few weeks ago about you know being depressed but I don't know what changed it certainly wasn't the weather because it's currently pouring cats and buckets outside um and I'm scratching one right now I love my little orange chicken kitty cat um <laughs> but um I don't know it's been raining for like two weeks but I am just like I just feel better and that's how depression works for me but this isn't that episode I want to talk about that in another one maybe but it's just like I just like woke up out of it and now I'm like productivity is at its all-time high like knocking things out and one of those things that I want to do again is horses but I just I cannot bring myself to just go like jog around in my field with her and I, I don't want to minimize what positive reinforcement trainers are doing but um but I do I want to ride that's the bottom line and um Zoe it's not like Zoe's never been backed before um it's not like she doesn't know any of that the biggest thing that we're going to have to overcome is um her reactivity and anxiety and I'll talk about that a bit more can you not I'm like just give me like an hour and then I'll mess with you guys <laughs> so needy um anyway so I'll talk about that a bit in a minute um so um I've just like really felt motivated to get back to horses and starting to get those ideas again you know I start thinking about it more I'm excited about it I'm reading more listening to podcasts about it again um reading blog posts about it again because like there for a little while I just like turned all of that off I was like I just I can't even be bothered to listen to a podcast or read a long post about training like I just I my mind cannot go there right now and that was fine um that's just that's where I was at and I know that about myself and depression and um it's not like being lazy and just avoiding everything I just know that that's that's what happens to me and I, it comes back I just get really burnt out and um just can't can't handle it and um that's exactly what I think happened with positive reinforcement and you know depression and not wanting to work with Zoe I just I really think that I got burnt out I got paralyzed in trying to be perfect and do everything this certain way and I got really caught up trying to do everything positive reinforcement and what quadrant is which like oh was that negative reinforcement was that negative punishment is that positive reinforcement when really it's all on a good old sliding scale and um I don't know it's it's not please don't oh well meh, please don't do that eh yes lay there um <laughs> Sorry, Cat has a sore on him and he just jumped up on my bed and like laid on it. It's gross. I just washed my sheets. Ugh. Um, anyway, um, so it's just, it's paralyzing to just be like, oh, I can't do anything or I'm going to like, you know, hurt my horse or create anxiety and, um, stress and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it just, it just, okay, good stutter. Um, <laughs> to, the idea of working with Zoe became a big source of like a moral dilemma and just created dissonance in me because I was like I really want to do this but I know that I can't because it's unethical or it's gonna be pushing her or then it's not force free training or it's not positive reinforcement training or if I um, you know ask her to do this then I'm forcing my agenda and I'm you know a bad horse trainer now and 
I don't think that that is necessarily fair. And, um, also like within all of that, um, you know, it's, it's very difficult to be perfect at the beginning. And I think that it's okay if you aren't, I think that if you're working with, you know, positive reinforcement, you need to know what you're doing, but it's really not that hard to learn. I mean, like once you learn how to recognize, um, what you're doing, like if you're using positive reinforcement or negative reinforcement or whatever, once you learn to recognize that and you learn how to ask correctly and like set up, you know, behavioral questions where the horse will succeed, um, it's really not that hard, but, um, you know, in trying to do everything in application and it, it's just like my skills are still developing and you, it's just, it's really hard to be perfect while they're developing. And I got really caught up in the idea that if I'm not doing it perfectly, then, um, then I'm being unethical or unfair to my horse. And then that was just like, okay, well, I guess I'm just not going to learn then, you know? Um, cause somebody has going to have to be the guinea pig <laughs> and like, it, mm, it's gotta be the horse. And cause you can't learn to train a horse without a horse. And, um, it just, I, I was just like, I got really overwhelmed by that. But the reality is hold for yawn. <sighs> is that four or five shots now? I hope you guys are not, huh? <laughs> Finish that thought. Hope you guys are not drunk enough that you won't be able to listen to the rest of me. Too many negatives. I can't even process that this morning. It's early. I've not had coffee. Um, but the thing is, like, you don't have to be perfect. I mean, it's very hard for type A OCD streaky people like me to not want to do everything perfect and be on point all the time and never do anything wrong. Um, but the reality is, like, I'm not perfect. And I can't expect perfection from me. I can't expect it from my horse and, um, shouldn't get so discouraged when it's not perfect because it's just a process. And, um, you know, the horses aren't perfect. Both of us, both the horse and the human make mistakes. We have bad days and, um, it's not going to be everything that you want it to be all the time. Um, but we also have the brilliant days and, you know, like those are the ones that are worth working toward. And, um, you know, doing all of that is, is what, like the point of this is it's to have fun. It's to enjoy your animal and to, um, you know, to learn and gain skills like responsibility and how to train an animal and, um, communication and patience. Like you learn so many things from working with horses and, um, it's, it's so valuable. And beyond that, the connection and the intimacy of that relationship is just, it's all so powerful. And I think it really gets a little bit muddy in, um, like, like, I don't, this is so hard to articulate because like, if I say one thing, it's going to sound like I'm like, screw science, but like, that's not, that's not what I'm saying. I think everything needs a balance. I don't think it can all just be science <laughs> because then it's, then you're sucking out like the fun and the humanity and the, you know, hoarseness and you, it's just like, then it becomes like an experiment and a science project. And, you know, that's not what we want, but I also don't want to promote the idea that, you know, you shouldn't like look at science at all because it's like, you can't do positive reinforcement or negative reinforcement well without knowing the science behind it. Um, like I know that all the years that I've been riding and doing positive reinforcement, I mean, negative reinforcement, like traditional training. Um, I didn't know why it worked. That doesn't make you a very effective trainer. If you don't know why what you're doing works, hold for water break. Wow. Okay. That water had propel in it and I was not ready for that. Okay. Um, <laughs> anyway, so the bottom line is in training, we have things that we want to do and that we enjoy. Like for me, I enjoy riding and jumping and horses have things that they enjoy. For instance, grazing and walking around in a paddock and getting food. Um, and the thing is you can also bring them together you know, the horse can enjoy things that you enjoy and you can enjoy things that the horse enjoys. Like 
I I love running around in the pasture with Zoe and, um, you know, training ground behaviors and working on stuff, uh, groundwork stuff. Um, but it's not all I want to do, you know, and, um, it gets, it gets boring after a while, just like it would if you were just like, I don't know, well, some people are probably dressage riders, but like, if you just did flat work all the time for me, like, it would get boring, and, um, or it'd be like, if you only ever studied math, or if you only ever studied English, like, you don't, you don't get a well-rounded picture, and, um, it can be difficult to, like, I don't know, just do different things, and I get very bored and burnt out, I need variety, um, so, we can value what they want just as much as, um, we value what we want. And that was a big, um, big deal for me. Um, for a while training just felt like martyrdom. Like it just felt like I was sacrificing what I wanted to do for the sake of ethicality and not stressing my horse out. And it's an interesting power shift of what happened because, you know, for the entire, time that I've had Zoe in our relationship, um, has been like, I'm the leader, you do what I say, and you don't have a choice. The end. And, um, I held all the power and I was using a lot of force and making her do what I wanted her to do. And then I moved out here, she had colic, and, um, then I switched to positive reinforcement. And then suddenly I just threw the reins at her and was like, your turn. (laughs) And, Um, it's just like, you're going to decide everything. And if she doesn't want to, um, you know, walk out of the pasture, if she'd rather go talk to another horse for 10 minutes, or if she'd rather, um, you know, graze or stop every five seconds along the way to take a bite or pull me off in another direction. Like, like, I just, I really cannot just be like, Hey, Zoe, anything that you want to do? let's do that. Like, it, it just, it's not practical. And I know that, um, if I were a super adept and savvy positive reinforcement trainer, I would say that like, okay, we need to teach the horse how to respond to lead rope cues and find a reinforcer that's more valuable than going and sniffing noses with another horse or grazing this new grass outside of their pasture. So they're more motivated to pay attention to like, or I could just use the lead rope. Like she knows and do like that. And then when it gets where we're going, reward. Or when she responds, reward. And I understand that that sounds like the poison cue scenario from Jesus or Zola's Ruiz, but like, I just, I really just, I cannot be in these constant world dilemmas of like, ah, what am I doing? Like, how do I, like, it's just, it's exhausting and it makes me not want to work with my horse. So I'm going to simplify it for me and, um, I'm going to move forward in that direction. And then if I don't like something I'm doing, I'm going to change it. But more on that later. I keep getting ahead of myself. Um, anyway, I just, I felt like anything that I wanted to do would be unethical. And that is not a good feeling. Like just feeling like any of your hopes and dreams are unethical or are going to take 10 years to get to. Um, and it, it's just, it's really frustrating because it, it, like I said, it made me not want to work with my horse because I was getting bored and, um, and paralyzed. And I felt like I just was never going to be good enough at this. And, um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's not a good feeling. Then you start to have negative associations yourself with riding and, um, working with your horse and it just creates a, a not so great environment for you. Water break again. Um, so, Um, so if it were in a human relationship, it would just would have been Zoe's just telling me everything that she wants me to do. And, um, you know, I had that same relationship with her for a while and, um, like flipped, (laughs) I mean, like vice versa. And, um, it's just, it's not, I wouldn't like that relationship, you know, just having somebody tell me what to do all the time. In fact, I've had that relationship and I did not like it. And, um, it's, I'm, I'm sure somebody in your life, you listener have, um, had a friend or a family member that just endlessly bosses you and you're just like, Hey dude, can we just like have a conversation instead of you just telling me what to do all the time? Or are you just being unwilling to do anything that I want to do? 
and um that's not a good relationship you really don't enjoy those you feel undervalued and um and I did it to myself because obviously Zoe's not like hey I don't care about you (laughs) like it's it, it was me um but I think that it's I I don't think it's unfair to want to value yourself too and I think that um you can create a balanced partnership I think that um you can balance valuing what they want with valuing what you want it doesn't have to be all or nothing either direction on you know I only value what I want or I only value what you want it can be like let's do this together let's compromise if the horse says no the horse says no like the end find a way to either make it better for the horse, make it, um, in a way that they will say yes. Maybe the horse doesn't understand, make the understanding clearer or, um, don't do it at all because the horse said no, you know, like, I mean, it's, it's respecting that instead of forcing and that's force free training. You you do not force the horse to do things against its will. Um, but you can ask and rephrase the question and make sure that the horse understands. And if they still say no, okay, cool. So, um, you know, and I would expect the same of her to me. I could not give you an example of how that would happen at the moment, but that's where we're going. Um, so instead of, uh, just let's do what you want to do, forget about me kind of relationship, I want, um, to be able to ask my horse if they would like to do what I would like you know, and, um, make it like a group effort. (laughs) Like we're doing this together. We are a team. We've always been a team. And, um, I just lost sight of that. And, um, and like, I don't want to say got caught up in, but I sort of did like got really caught up in science. And while yes, it holds true. And I believe that you can train horses strictly through, through positive reinforcement. I 100% believe that. It's just not, um, it's not something that I feel like I can do right now. And, um, maybe in the future it'll be something that I do, but, um, you know, right now I just, I want to just be able to like ease up on that a little bit and just work with my horse, you know? And, um, so again, I am not, you know, here to force my agenda on Zoe. Like, this is what I don't want you guys to take away from this episode is that because I wasn't getting to do what I wanted that now I'm changing my, my training methods so that I can force my agenda on my horse. That's not what's happening. I just like, I haven't been doing anything with my horse because, um, I just, I just didn't like how our training was going really. And, um, I was very bored with it. I didn't enjoy it. And I think that there is a way to make positive reinforcement practical. I think there's a way to make it fun. And I think that way is to, um, you know, just ease up a little bit and not make it every single behavior must be trained through exclusive positive reinforcement. The horse must have full autonomy all the time. Um, um, I mean, like, I don't have full autonomy in my life. The horse does not have full autonomy in their lives. They're not free range horses with no predators, you know, just like it's, I mean, they're, they're pastured stalled animals and, um, they will have pressure in their lives and they should know how to respond to it. And, um, I just, I think that it's, um, I think that positive reinforcement is, incredible and I think that it can be made practical and I think it can be the basis of training and I'm hoping to be able to um, demonstrate that. Um, One of my good friends, uh, Meyer Horsemanship on Instagram, M-E-Y-E-R Horsemanship, I'm hoping to have them on the podcast very soon, Um, but they are just an incredible, incredible trainer it just, it absolutely blows me away. I'm sorry. My eyes are itching like freaking crazy. And I don't, I don't know why it's like, I just woke up and decided I'm allergic to my house. Um, it's making me very distracted. Anyway, they're an incredible trainer and do so, so, so much positive reinforcement. And, um, but it's not 
only positive reinforcement. And we've had several conversations um, since my last podcast, and um, I just, I really want to get them on. Um, but it, I, I don't know, it's, it's just like having an example like that, um, somebody that I've been friends with for years and years and years, and we've both changed our training so much it's kind of incredible (laughs) um but um like they're just doing it in such an awesome way um and um it wasn't like um seeing them doing that wasn't my like oh that's what I want to do so I'm just gonna switch I'm not just latching on to everyone around me I promise um it's just it's kind of what I was feeling and then once I identified like where I was at then I started noticing that and I was like oh yeah see that that's what I want to do um so that's what I've been thinking put into practice so anyway I'm a little bit behind because I'm only just now coming to this realization instead of having started there um I think that's another thing that really happens with people that start with positive reinforcement diving all in head first it it can get really overwhelming really fast instead of just like slowly transitioning over and there are the own struggles with that but just because something is a little bit more difficult doesn't make it something that's not worthwhile I absolutely think learning positive reinforcement and making yourself a better well-rounded trainer is absolutely worth it um but it is it is not easy I mean, especially since positive reinforcement, you essentially have to teach yourself because there aren't really any trainers that use it as a primary or basis for training. Um, So anyway, just a few more points that I want to hit on here um, is I'm not forcing my agenda with my horse. I'm not steamrolling her if she says no. I'm going to respect it if she says no. Um, First, like if I ask her to... I don't know, turn left. If I ask her to turn left and she says no, I'm going to find a way to explain it better um, or to ask it more clearly. And if she still says no, okay, cool. But um, I'm not going to um, return to using spurs and whips and escalating pressure. And by escalating pressure, I mean like pulling harder, kicking harder, things like that. Like, I just, I will not use that on her. I know it doesn't work and she doesn't appreciate it. It makes her hate riding and it makes her very tense and stressed and we're not doing it. So, um, you know, if she says no, she says no, I'm not forcing her into doing something. Um, but that said, that doesn't mean that it's going to be, um, you know, a fully hands-off approach, nor am I sure that that's entirely not only practical, but necessary. I'm not sure that the horses need to be handled with kid gloves all the time. And, um, and I do not mean that derogatorily for anybody who uses exclusive positive reinforcement, but I'm just, I'm not sure. And I'll find out very soon because I'm about to apply all of this. I would love to have already been applying it, but the weather, as I said, um, but like just, to take a totally hands-off approach and be like, oh, you can't handle any pressure at all is just a little bit impractical to me. And, um, if you're a positive reinforcement trainer who uses pressure, then like, then it's, well, a positive reinforcement based trainer, I guess I should say, then uses pressure that I'm not talking about you. But if you use like zero pressure at all and, um, like, I don't know. I feel like it's a little bit, um, and maybe some horses need it. I mean, I, I don't know. Um, each horse is individual and I think that it's very hard to apply, um, one thing to one horse, but I think that there is a difference in, um, you know, like just forcing your agenda and making your horse do things and being like, see, he's fine. And also being like, um, you know, maybe we don't have to just like be hands off passive all the time. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but what I don't want people to take from this is me being like using exclusive positive reinforcement may be a little too laissez faire on the horse. Um, as like, Oh yeah, see, I can use positive or negative reinforcement and traditional training because my horse can take it. Like he's, he doesn't care. Like I think that you should work to use, uh, hello. I think that you should use to uh, work to using um, 
the least amount of pressure possible and the most amount of positive reinforcement possible. I think that that should be the goal for horsemanship. I think it should really move away from the Maryland Littles of the world and big gag bits and bloody mouths spurs and beating our horses around a course. I really think that it should not be that way. It's That's a bit ridiculous, and if you don't agree, you're living in the wrong century. Um, look at literally any other animal training industry. But, um, yeah, so anyway, um, I just, I and Kane Meyer Horsemanship, we're all trying to move towards making positive reinforcement more accessible and more practical for people because, I mean, for a lot of people living in a stable or riding with instructors, it's not practical to just switch 100%. People lead your horse in and out of the barn and um, you cannot just do 100% positive reinforcement and that's where I'm at. It's like just a little bit of negative reinforcement, just a little bit. It doesn't mean I'm denouncing positive reinforcement. I'm not running away from it. I'm not saying, oh, this is hard. I don't want to do it anymore. It's not that. It's just not practical anymore. I need to be able to get my horse out of the paddock. She needs to stand in cross ties, and I need to ride her. And I said she needs to stand in cross ties very aggressively, but she stands wonderfully through positive reinforcement. She used to dance around and wiggle and be such a pain in the ass in the cross ties. And now um, I can groom her and she stands, I can fully tack her up, and she stands, and, it, like, positive reinforcement, guys, it freaking works, it helps, um, and it's just, it's all about how you can increase the communication with the horse, how can you be as clear as possible, how can you help the horse understand, and what I'm gonna try and do with negative reinforcement is use it as information instead of force, and, um, I'm gonna mess up, and Zoe's gonna misread it, and I'm gonna misuse it, but my effort is going to be um, in the way that I, I want to use it to be like, let's turn this way. You know, I want you to turn this way. You'll get rewarded if you do. And um, instead of like, I'm going to pull you this way and your reward is going to be hands off. <laughs> like, if that makes sense. Um, so um, I'm open to mild pressure. I don't want to use escalating pressure, but I think that... Um, you know, pressure in terms of applying rain pressure, like pulling on the rain a little bit. Um, just simple direction. Um, being able to put my leg on and work with lateral movements that way. I'm not going to be pushing her over with my leg or um, kicking her or things like that. Just being able to move her around and off my leg. And um, just because I am reintroducing negative reinforcement does not mean that I'll be doing what I used to and going right back to traditional training. I'm not going to just like go back to my old event and coach and like start doing that all over again. You know, just like let's pick up and start jumping three foot again. Like that's not, it's not what we're going to do. I would like to get back to doing stuff like that. I miss it like crazy, but, um, I don't really ever see eventing being our thing. And I honestly like, yeah, I miss it, but at the same time, I don't, like, um, I don't miss being that stressed, and I don't miss, um, being upset with myself and my horse <laughs> all the time, and, um, I don't miss that amount of perfection, I don't miss the amount of stress that we were both under, um, like, yes, the competitions can be fun, but a lot of the time they just weren't, and, um, even the one that I won, I didn't really enjoy that much. Like, it's just, I don't know. I'm kind of like, okay, not competing. I just, I want to compete with myself. <laughs> I want to, like, work with Zoe. That's what I want to do. Um, so, yeah, I'm not going right back to um, the traditional training style or anything like that. I'm still using predominantly positive reinforcement. But um, mostly all of this was just an effort to be like, hey, I kind of changed my mind. This is where I'm at, and if you see me using pressure, don't yell at me. I know. That was the point, you know? Um, so, what what's different about what I'm doing now is that I'm listening so much more to Zoe than I ever was when I did traditional training, and I'm being okay with um, her saying no um, instead of me saying or following that up with, uh, you must, you have no choice, you have to, um, and the priority along with that is, um, her well-being and her happiness and mine as well. You know, I want both of us to be happy and safe 
and um, able to trust one another. So, um, you know, I'm still deciding what I believe in, and I think that that's, um, that's, that's just been a huge theme for my <laughs> social media presence, and um, I just, I, I think that I need to say, um, for the sake of some trials that, well, I don't know that trolls actually would listen to, like, 45 minutes of my podcast, um, but I think that, um, you know, it doesn't make me a hypocrite that I've changed my mind. It doesn't make me a failure. It doesn't mean I'm, like, the worst positive reinforcement trainer in the world or that I failed at it and that's why I'm changing or that everything I've said in the past, I'm just a hypocrite. The thing is, like, people are allowed to, to grow and change and I don't think you should be afraid of the quote-unquote I told you so elitism in the horse world of being like well I was right and you were wrong or I knew you were gonna do that like let people do their freaking journeys dude like just let people explore and learn and if they ask for help offer them help or just be there that if they want help you can give it to them you know like I, I just, I don't think that it makes me a hypocrite for going now against what I've said in the past. I think that was where I was at. That was what was working for me. That's what I believed in and that's what I wanted, but that's allowed to change. And we are so bad about that in the horse world that like you, you must be right at all times. And if you're not, you're an idiot or, um, you know, you're a hypocrite. And that's the favorite word of the horse world. Oh my God, it's so annoying. Like, nobody's allowed to change their mind. You must believe what you believed when you were 12. I'm like, dude, I'm I'm coming up on 22. Like, I'm not going to be the same person. And that's okay. Like, it's it's fine. And you shouldn't be scared to, like, you know, post what you believe now if, if it changes for fear of offending people. Like, you cannot live your life um, afraid of other people. It must be your life for you. If you want to post about it, post about it and just be ready for that backlash. But, um, you know, it's unfortunately I didn't get backlash for the, um, positive reinforcement post because everyone's like, oh, cool. She's coming back to what we are doing um, for the most part. But, um, uh, I think that, um, I got a lot more backlash for changing my mind and going to positive reinforcement. Everyone was like, well, you did this and this and this and this and this and this and this in the past. And, um, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> I think that people are a lot more keen to accept what you're doing if you're doing something that looks more like what they are, if that makes sense. Um, but regardless, this feels more right to me and, um, I'm allowed to experiment. And in the past, I feel like I thought that I was a very mild, um, traditional rider. I didn't feel like I was very harsh on the horses. I felt like I had more of a heart than a lot of the people around me. Um, you know, when my trainer would tell me to like yank on my horse or, you know, beat her, rip her teeth out. Um, I would not, <laughs> I would do a very mild version of that to appease my trainer. Um, and you know, I also thought that I was like disciplining my horse. Um, but I just couldn't bring myself to like actually be vicious. And I have seen it in my trainers and um, fellow riders and uh, just, it's everywhere. It really is. Um, but I just, I cannot, cannot do that. And I'm allowed to decide that that doesn't work for me. I'm allowed to go full positive reinforcement and um, make that my priority. And I'm also allowed to find a middle ground. Um, even then, on like a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being traditional training, 10 being positive reinforcement, I'm at like a 7 or an 8 positive reinforcement, like, if that makes sense. So, it's not, I'm not switching mostly back to traditional with a dose of positive reinforcement, that's not it. It's positive reinforcement with a dose of uh, negative reinforcement. Um, so, I don't want to be, you know, called a hypocrite, I mean like, call me a hypocrite, whatever, <laughs> like, it. it's whatever. I just want to, um, just want to make that point that, like, just because somebody changes what they believe in doesn't make it, um, doesn't make it automatic hypocrisy. I would like to see the people calling everyone a hypocrite, um, see if they believe what they believed when they were 10 years younger or five years younger, one year younger, you know, you don't, you just, you grow up, you evolve, you change, and you're allowed to do that, and, um, 
like what makes people a hypocrite is when they say like I'm not I'm not that way like I don't do that and then they go and do that like within the same like week let's say (laughs) um anyway um look up the definition of hypocrite for yourself but um I think that it's it's just really thrown around in the horse world unnecessarily I don't think that it needs to be um so bottom line um I love positive reinforcement it has done absolutely just like unfathomable cannot speak no words um amazing things for my relationship with Zoe it's brought us so much closer together is it's helped her training so much she is a completely different horse than she used to be she stands in the cross size she lets me brush her she lets me tack her up she's not biting pinning her ears the whole time she comes up to me in the pasture she nickers at me every time she sees me um she is incredible to walk on the lead rope um she lunges incredibly she I mean like there are just so many things she knows so many like fun tricks and um we just have a lot going for us and um the next step I think is taking that to the saddle and I want to um work towards that goal and um so you know I love hearing you guys' stories about how much positive reinforcement has helped you and I don't want anything that I've said today to deter anyone from using positive reinforcement. If anything, it should be pushing you towards it. Um, and if it's not, then I've not done a good job explaining. Um, but I think that everyone should, should use it to some degree or another and gradually work towards it being the predominant training method because the science shows that it's, it's incredibly, incredibly useful and um not everything has to be done through push and pull you know you have to do this or else um and unfortunately that's a lot of what we're taught um with horses but um in doing so it's brought me to to like an incredible community of wonderful people i've met so many people through positive reinforcement that i like unforgettable experiences and conversations and i've learned so much through people that have been so generous and open with their knowledge and willing to share and um that's not something that really is common in the horse world and I know that sometimes positive reinforcement people can get a little preachy and a little pushy of um you know what they believe in but it's it's really just because they're like this is incredible I love what this is doing for my horse and I want to share it and um what I don't agree with is the like you're being unethical I think that we need to have a little bit more compassion um, for others that aren't doing what we're doing, um, and not in the way that, like, oh, you just haven't, like, realized what I've realized yet, but, like, you know, that's just where you're at, and you're allowed to be there, um, but it's, I think it's, it's a wildly different community, because people who train with positive reinforcement are a lot more keen to be, like, yeah, you do this, and this, and this, and this is why this is happening, and this is how you can fix it, and you can look up this resource, and do this, and, um, read this article, this blog, and, like, Um, you just really don't get that in the traditional horse world. I know some people, of course, um, will, um, answer all your questions and be keen to help, but it's not quite to the degree, oh, just dropped my microphone, it's not quite to the degree that, um, we see it in positive reinforcement, at least in my experience. Um, sorry, I'm trying to take off my, my jacket, got a little warm. Um, so, um, beyond that, um... I feel like I, um, positive reinforcement gave me an opportunity to start a conversation about, um, ethicality and horsemanship. And at least in my small corner of the internet, um, I got people thinking and I like, I can't believe that I made an impact like that. Um, it like, and I'm not trying to toot my own horn here and be like, Oh my God, I'm so powerful. (laughs) But like, um, getting people like thinking about positive reinforcement and like even if you know you don't use it you might have looked it up and been like oh okay there's that and then maybe we'll come back to it later you know when you're able to or you're um you know ready to um explore a new method for whatever reason maybe you get a new a new horse and you're like maybe I should try that thing you know um so for whatever reason 
it's it's created a lot of conversation and people are thinking about it and um it's it's making um at least the people that follow slash followed me um you know consider how ethical is this am i forcing my horse or am i asking my horse is this a partnership or is it a dictatorship you know and um i think that um it's created an emphasis on ethics in equestrianism and I think that that doesn't look the same for everyone and I think that that's okay um but I think that as long as we're thinking about it that's um awareness is the first step you know um so all in all not turning my back on positive reinforcement um but I'm willing to explore and beyond that now I would like to talk a little bit about what my plans are and um so what I've been doing, um, as I have stated at some point or another, um, I'm taking Zoe out of her paddock and, um, it stresses her mama out a little bit. Um, and she, she has everything she needs in her paddock, but still taking Zoe out is just not her favorite thing in the world. And I don't have anybody to help me. So she's just going to have to learn that that's going to be a regular occurrence and be okay with it. Um, so what I've been doing is just taking Zoe out and, um, Zoe's totally fine. So relaxed. Don't have to pull on the lead rope at all. She just follows me and, um, going to the cross ties, put her in the cross ties. She stands and I brush her and pick out her hooves. And yes, I treat her the whole time, um, for standing still. And then, um, I tack her up and started out with the bareback pad and just having something like go up and over her back and girthing her up and um using that as a like you know um precursor to a saddle um to see how she would react with the girth and she's totally fine so I eventually graduated to using my saddle and um uh, she was totally fine. The first time I put it on and girth it up, she was totally fine. And I think that's exactly how training should go. I think that, um, when you get to where you want to be, it should be going well with no reaction, nothing. I think that's a sign that things are, you've done things correctly. Um, I think that if there's a big blow up, um, you need to take a step or seven back. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, I've gotten on her, or I haven't, well, I did get on her the other day for a photo shoot, but I just, like, sat on her. It wasn't, like, a thing. But she stood po- politely at the mounting block. That was really nice. Um, but I don't think she likes bareback very much. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start in a saddle for the most part, and um, I'm just going to get on her and walk for, I don't know how long. I'm not going to put a time limit on it, but I'm estimating a month or two. Um of just like as consistent as I can be, um, if the weather would chill out, um, I just want to get on her and walk around and retrain my leg because right now to her, my leg is a scary thing. It's something that, um, says run away from me and, um, she doesn't like it. She gets jumpy and if my leg bumps her at all or rests on her side at all, she goes forward. And, um, that's not, (laughs) that's not what we want. And she's always been like that. Like I've always had to have quite a bit of pressure in the bridle. And that's another thing. We're not using a bit. I'm going, well, she, she turns perfectly fine and she stops fine. But, um, I want to, um, make sure that all of that is good. Cause I, I mean, in goal, I'd like to be able to ride a bridle list, but isn't that everyone's dream? (laughs) Um, but I'm hoping that we can get there. But first, um, she needs to be okay with my body. You know, I need to find a way to make it, um, accessible to her. And, um, that's my plan is just to get on and take everything down like 75 notches and, um, work on some lateral stuff and not like just a ton of pressure and force and any of that. Just like, I'd like you to move off my leg and let's do that. And I'm not going to ask you to try and, um, then we'll gradually work up to it and then we'll work up to canter. And that's how I want to go about this instead of, um, just like, okay, I'm going to hop on and try and fix everything all at once. Walk, trot, and canter. 
no, I went to go make walk, um, you know, good and comfortable for both of us, um, to where I don't have that reactivity. And then, um, then we can start introducing, um, some more of the faster gates. So that's my plan for right now. Um, I know that's a big, big grand goal there, but huh, that's where we're at. And that's our, that's our reality. And that's, that's what we're doing. So anyway, I think that that about covers this podcast. And, um, I think I'm going to throw this episode up on YouTube and I'm going to see how it does and what you guys think. And I want you guys to let me know if you, um, that's a weird sound. Um, let me know if you want me to keep doing that and if you like it. And if you don't, also let me know about that or I can attempt to make another account and post that. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about all that. We'll see. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm going to put this one up on YouTube because I feel like it's an important conversation and um, I want you guys to give me some feedback on that. Let me see. Let me see what you like. Um, so yeah, I think that that just about covers it. Um, if you guys want to follow me on the social media platforms, you can find me at, um, Jet Equithery on YouTube. That's J-E-T-E-Q-U-I-T-H-E-O-R-Y. Um, you can find me at Jill.Trees. That's my personal J-I-L-L dot T-R-E-E-C-E. And then, um, this podcast, you can find Jet Real Podcast on Instagram. I don't need to spell that, I think. Um, I think you got that one. Um, I also have a Facebook page, Jet Real Podcast and Jet Equa Theory. Um, if you want to friend me on Facebook, I'd rather you follow me um, at Jill Trees because um, I don't accept people that I don't know because I don't want my feed messed up. I like to see my friends and family. Um, but beyond that, um, you can listen to this podcast on any platforms that you'd like. Please leave a rating because it helps push me in the algorithm, helps more people listen and, um, mama's got to eat. So please do that. Um, and beyond that, I think we are good to go ladies and gents. So thank you guys endlessly for listening to this podcast. I hope that my message was clear and, um, I hope that it will be well received. And I hope that at some point I have made you question and wonder. And I think that, I think that's what life is about is, questioning and learning <clears throat> and challenging yourself and others and ideas and finding what you believe in the most and that's that's what I have hung true to so with that I will leave you guys please check me out on all those social medias um, drop a rating on this and um, that's gonna be it thank you guys so much for listening all right have a good one